This is Truth Frequency Radio. And thanks again for joining us for another live broadcast. I'm your host, Zen Garcia, and this is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. Well, I've had recently a, a number of shows where I've been able to read from the ancient manuscripts and I know that a lot of you do appreciate and that you are wanting to hear um, about the ancient collections, which, you know, not a lot of people have access to, especially the Thracian Chronicles and the narratives that are contained within that material, which I love to share that information with you and to be able to read the translations that I have received and we are making great progress and strides towards finishing a lot of these ancient texts and we still have an entire new collection of manuscripts to go into at some point uh, which I'm very excited about that as well as the Thracian epistles, which are as extensive in as far as um, page count. It's like 736 pages of material with the Thracian chronicles and the Thracian epistles are similar in bulk. So there's a lot of information to be brought forward. And also with the epistles, there are so much more um, substance as far as the, the breakdown because historically the uh, material that does make up the epistles, which a lot of it is from the dialogues of the apostles and their interactions with 
the community and each other um, that these books were relatively short in length. And so they're quite numerous. And I have uh, actually a title of a lot of that material, the the titles for, let me actually look it up and maybe I'll share some of this with you since I'm talking about it. And it is also um, a collection which most people have never heard about and had chance to read and study. And uh, there's a lot of them, so I don't want to go through all of them, but I will share give you insight into what I'm talking about. Especially since I have it before me. There are 33. So I'll just I'll just share the first 10 with you and then at some point when I actually received this material and I can start reading through it. Uh, we also have, you know, the source of um, some of these narratives. And so, especially for those of you that are part of the ancient Thracian peoples and the bloodline lineages which make up uh, the modern day Bulgarian people that still live there and have as capital Sofia, which I think is so cool because Sofia being, you know, the Greek word um, for wisdom and wisdom being uh, the feminine aspect of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. I mean, what a great name for a capital wisdom. <clears throat> but anyways, so let me share this with you. And then I'll go ahead and get back into the reading of the book of Navi because I am close to catching up with what I have received in chapters. Uh, there's still a third of the book to be translated. And so, uh, but I do have probably enough to fill up this show and maybe even uh, another two hour segment. But I hope that you are enjoying the storyline. I myself am very much enjoying reading it and sharing it with you. And looking at uh, and gaining insight into the the Thracian line, the empire which came about of them and how they ruled over uh, a large part of even what Alexander the Great had successfully conquered, you know, so much time later that they were the original empire which post flood uh, had been established by the children of Noah and that was spread uh, across the Mediterranean basin and that of the Black Sea, the Middle East and Europe and Asia. I mean, it was quite an extensive empire, even Northern Africa and down the nations of the Middle East. Um, and it shows that, you know, their mythologies are truly based uh, and are 
connected to this one ancient culture and that the Thracian peoples are the oldest as far as the most ancient script um, and their artifacts are the oldest and when you look at them it seems they are the most um, beautiful in artistry as well uh, that I believe that even some of the techniques for um, being able to create the artifacts that they did has been lost, that there were metals that were utilized and made part of the mix which brought forth the ancient Thracian treasures that these treasures have... Um, smelt and materials in them that you know the metallurgists weren't able to um, did not have the capacity to to do and I don't remember exactly what <clears throat> those metals were and you know, as far as the details of all that, but you can read in looking at the ancient Thracian artifacts and see that they were highly skilled and that they had technology and wisdom which far surpassed even, you know, the capabilities of people in this day and age, so... All right, I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the content of the Thracian epistles. The first is the coming of Melchizedek. It is a, a Qumran text, part of the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. Um, the epistle of Melchizedek to the churches in the whole beast empire. It's called Corpus Melchizedekum. And... I think some of these are Latin texts. And also, you know, the ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, such such on and so forth. <clears throat> the third is the first epistle of Melchizedek to the brothers in Thracia. The second epistle of Melchizedek to the brothers in Thracia. The ones who call themselves Thracians and today Bulgarians. That's the fourth book. The fifth book is the hidden first and second chapters of the second epistle of Melchizedek to the chosen brothers in Thracia. Number six, the unfinished epistle of Melchizedek to the faithful brothers of all churches and congregations of Christ. Number seven, the epistle of St. Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi in Little Thracia. Number eight, the epistle of St. Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, which is Big Thracia. Number nine, the epistle of St. Apostle Paul to the church in Colas in Big Thracia. I guess I'll read a few more than just the 10. Number 10, the first epistle of St. Apostle John, written in Ephesus, Big Thracia. The second epistle of St. Apostle John, written in Ephesus. Number 12, the third epistle of St. Apostle John, written in Ephesus, Big Thracia. Number 13, the epistle of Asclepius, the Thracian to the king of Egypt, Amon. Number 14, the song of Orpheus, the secret discussion between the triple great oracle and his son. Number 15, 
the discussion of the triple great oracle about the good shepherd. Number 16, the epistle of St. Polycarp to the church in Philippi, which is Little Thracia. Number 17, a word for the ship, the Ark of the Lord. Corpus Chronicum, the Book of Enoch. Liber Enochi, pyramid texts from the Papyrus of Ani. Number 18, the Chronicles of the Ancient Egyptians. The historian Mantheo about the ancient beginnings of Egypt and Jerusalem. Sounds very interesting. It is the Corpus Chronicum Chronicles of the Kings. Chronicia Regum. Number 19. Praise word of Saint Clement of Orid about Saint Cyril, the philosopher. Number 20, the proclamation to the gospel of Saint Cyril, the philosopher, about the power of the Holy Scripture in Slavic language. Number 21, the epistle of priest monk David to the Thracian Christians. Number 22, the epistle of Ethan, the scribe of God to the sensible ones. I might as well just read all of them. I mean, where else are you going to hear about this stuff? So, <clears throat> number 23, the epistle of Ethan, the scribe of God to the faithful Thracian brothers. Number 24, the epistle of Yadai, the priest and warrior of God to the submerged ones in the fire. 25, the first epistle of God's servant, Michael. 26, the second epistle of God's servant, Michael. 27, the revelation of Saint Apostle John containing the epistles of Christ to the churches in Asia Minor. Number 28, the Ode for Praise of Christ from the Book of Enoch, the Liber of Enochi. <clears throat> Interesting, uh, it makes you wonder if these are some of the 366 books of Enoch which have been lost since ancient times. And remember that, and I'll be getting probably into it tonight, that the Book of Navi uh, is a story about how the ancient writings that were carried over through the Ark. And I'm talking about the Ark of Noah, that these ancient writings and the testaments of the ancient forefathers and for you know the matriarchs as well <clears throat> that they were buried by the children of noah <clears throat> before the flood even occurred in the they were orpheus was later when he came to power and was selected to be priest, prophet, and king, that he was led by the Lamb of God, the word of the Lord, to the rediscovery of this material. And so it could very well be that some of this ancient Thracian material uh, that we have not yet seen originated with the prophet Enoch. And I'm guessing, you know, this Liber meaning book, uh, the book of Enoch, that <clears throat> um, 
I would guess that it would be something other than the Book of Enoch, which we have access to, and which includes the narrative on the Watchers and that of the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, the also the storyline of what is the animal farm parable, which covers all the descendants and the line of Adam from the beginning to the end of days. <clears throat> Including much material on the Ancient of Days and also the Son of Man, which is what Daniel refers to Christ as being. And so without a doubt, the the Book of Enoch that we have is messianic and that it is prophetic and confirmation of this um, was testified by the Dead Sea Scroll collection as the Book of Enoch was a favorite of the Qumran community and that their uh, split from the uh, the Pharisees and the ancient rabbinical authorities <clears throat> and their separation and their gathering of a lot of that ancient material that these documents are BC and that they were compiled and, and buried um, before the coming of the Messiah into mortal embodiment. And you know, I mean, which makes sense because <clears throat> they are speaking prophetically of his advent, first advent. All right, let me continue. And then after the first break, we will get into the reading for this evening. Number 28, Ode for Praise of Christ. And this also is the Book of Enoch. 29, a chapter about the Great Judgment Day and the justification through Isis, Jesus, the Book of Enoch. So there's a lot of these epistles are said to originate with Book, books of Enoch, which is interesting as well that um, if you've not ever read the the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs that they make mention, and those are also prophetic, and they were verified by the Dead Sea Scrolls collection as well. But anyways, um, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs um, which are, you know, all the the 12 children that were born unto Jacob, that these patriarchs speak about and tell the story of their lives. But very interestingly, they speak about and uh, talk about and make mention of the coming of Christ. And that they also speak about prophetically knowing what's going to happen to their children from having read the books of the righteous Enoch. And there's books, plural. So, you know, they obviously had and were receptive to material that has since been lost. And that was carried through on the ark in which they had received as legacy. And so perhaps, you know, some of this is part of that which they were receptive of. Interesting um, to consider. All right, continue. If, so we do try to finish up before break. All right. 
Book 30, him for glorification of Isis, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is also from a Libra in Okai. 31, the revelation about the words of Isis, the words of strength. And this too is the Book of Enoch, Libra Enochi, pyramid text, the papyrus of Ani. 32, a chapter about giving strength of Isis to Enoch. Wow, that's interesting. Because here we have the mention of Christ, Isis, Jesus, and his coming to Enoch. Which we know that, you know, in the... <clears throat> In the Targum, we see quite a bit of this, that the word of the Lord was the strength for Abraham and Jacob and uh, Joseph and uh, the other patriarchs of the 12 tribes. Uh, and that he was, you know, he was in the garden um, when Adam and Eve tried to hide themselves. Uh, after having been beguiled by the serpent and that he was the one that cast them out of paradise and even gave them the the prophecy of his coming how he would be born of their descendants as one of their children uh, 5500 years after their removal from paradise all right, um, 33, the last one, before we get to break. The greatest Thracian epistle, the Holy Gospel according to St. Apostle John, written in Ephesus, Corpus Apostolicum, Apostolicum which, excuse my Latin, because, yeah. And so, um, that's it. That's the 33 books of the Thracian epistles. And I'd like to thank Stella, of course, for her translation and also her discovery of this material because I had told her about the, the books that um, she should get and which she can read because she can read the book area. All right, we'll be right back. Here. social problems be kind of like professional disasters mm -hmm. so for example if i know that i've been late a few times i've been late a few times in a social sense and i'm like oh, i'll spot oh I'll, I'll i'll arrive late mm -hmm. you know i gotta make an entrance and you're used to that in a social setting and people have said hey jamar don't, don't be late man you're like ah all right no problem i'll show to the party on town next time yeah that social issue becomes a professional disaster because if you're late in that social sense, when you're late as a professional, you could miss out an opportunity. People will see that you're coming in late, so they may limit the recommendations they have for other people to, uh, for you to, towards other people. And then it, it just doesn't show good for your brand. So to circumvent that, it's you know find out what your social problems are, so to speak. What what do you do maybe internally or with friends that people have told you that's a problem and fix it there, so that it doesn't affect you and become a professional disaster. Extendivite is more than just a heart tonic. Do you have any of these symptoms? Night cramps in the hands and feet. Your arms and legs often go to sleep. On short walks, do your legs get aches and pains? Is your memory worse than it used to be? Ankles that swell late in the day? Has your blood pressure increased lately? If you answered yes to even one of these questions, you may have early warning signs of arterial blockages. Your body is saying that it is time to take Extendivite. These are not the normal signs of aging. They are the warning signs that accompany blocked arteries. Get your Extendivite today. 
Extendivite is available in capsule or liquid form for just $69.95 for a two-month supply. To get started, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendovite. Travis Cook, America's evil genius, here to invite you to join us every Tuesday afternoon here on Truth Frequency Radio. No, on our show you will not see a bunch of three-piece suits or a cocktail party. And you certainly won't see a bunch of inside the Beltway band But you will see eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion, the likes of which you won't see anywhere else in media. America's evil genius. We come to you every Tuesday from the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri, where there's always a good race riot or sex scandal just around the corner. Join us every Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, and noon on the left coast right here on TFRLive.com. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, on TruthFrequencyRadio.com. Real people, real radio. Initiating the truth frequency. This is Truth Frequency Radio. And in those days, there were giants in the land, and the sons of the angels of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, and took of them wives, and their sons became of old great men of renown. So they have been mixing with us on a genetic level since the time of Enoch and Ezekiel's will. Here on earth we're intrigued by the sun, moon, and stars, and imagine there's got to be planets like ours. So conceive of a face on the surface of Mars, so in need of a meaning and purpose we fall. And indeed they believe that these might be our gods, or that maybe with time we'll do right and evolve, and eventually reach what they seek, and then solve all the problems of man, but they really don't know that they fall. Works of our hands are but just filthy rags, so we travel the lands to dig up our past. Time our lapses and with it are much of the facts of our magic that God's came in. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second portion. There is a question from the chat room as to whether we will be holding a second conference. And we have decided to um, to go ahead and start the process of getting that set up. And so at some point, I believe it's going to be May of next year, but you'll have to ask Justin and Joy about that. They're, they're the ones behind the coordination of it. Uh, I'm just, you know, a speaker, so uh, they'll just point the way and I'll go do my thing. But <clears throat> thank goodness I don't have to do all that other stuff. Um, and so, yes, just reach out to Justin and Joy and I'll have them speak about it. And it is something that we are planning on as i said beginning the process of it's a lot of work so um definitely takes a few months at least to to prepare all right and so let me get back to the manuscript And this was, I believe, chapter 13, and we're at verse 8. So continuing with the book of Navi. Actually, I'll, I'll go back and read just a few passages because we were at the story about Orphe. So I'll go back to verse 5. 
He shall glorify my name, the name of the god Dion of Thrace, the sun-giving Isis in all the land. And because of him, all the tribes shall once again speak of Orphe and my covenant before the great day of our Lord. And when the boy was born, they called him Get, because he was kinsman of the Gete. And when he was seven years old, his father initiated him into the priesthood in the temple. He received the divine nature, the Holy Spirit. He gave him the holy name, Orphiosa, because this is how it was prophesied about him, that he would be a great son of Orphe. And this is how he was remembered for all time by the name Orpheus. And when he came of age, according to Thracian custom, Orpheus decided to head out and travel the wide world to accomplish feats for God and the people of Thrace and to earn a bright, well-known name so that he can be a worthy keeper of his people. And when he was in the temple of Dionysus in Pere and stood immersed in fasting and prayer, seeking out God's will and guidance for his upcoming journey, lo and behold, a wondrous vision appeared before him. A white-headed sage was standing in front of him who said to him, Orpheus, I am your great-grandfather, Trax, whom you do not know. When I was your age, I headed out to walk the earth with my companions to accomplish great feats and to earn a worthy name for myself, as you yourself intend to do also. However, evil forces instigated the Achaeans to sacrifice me to their gods so that they may bereave us from the holy posterity of our people, that our name not be mentioned ever again among the tribes. But when they had placed me on the altar and had pressed their knife against my throat, a wondrous golden ram suddenly took my place, and when they sacrificed it, they thought that they had put an end to the name of Trex. And then the golden ram rose above the sacrificial flames and took me far away from the Achaeans and carried me to many places after which it left me in Colchis, where the bed of Phocis is. There stood the great temple of my God, who had appeared before me in the image of the golden ram. and had rescued me. And there in that temple lies to this day the golden fleece of the ram alongside the ark with my bones. I beseech thee in the name of the God of Thrace, bring my bones back to my birthplace, Pere in Thrace, and take with you as a reward the golden fleece which my bones are wrapped with in the ark. By doing so, you shall return 
the glory of Thrace and earn yourself a kingly name for all time. And Orpheus was still in awe of what he had just seen. When suddenly a radiant lamb, like it was of gold, faced him and spoke in a human voice. Orpheus, son of the great Orphe, I am the god of your fathers, the son giving Isis. Your forefather Orphe rejoiced in my word day and night. Do fulfill the request of old tracks and bring the ark with his bones back to the temple in Pere. For in the ark also lies three tablets of Orphe, which belong to your paternal home. Your guide shall be Anzon, and he will return to you the throne of your forefathers, which by right belongs to whosoever wields the secrets of the golden runes on the scrolls of lambskin written by the holy keepers of Thrace. I shall be by your side throughout your entire journey, and the spirits of the great holy men of ancient times will accompany you as well, for their hearts will find no peace until all the ancient scriptures have been restored and brought back to Pere. Arise now, belt yourself and begin your journey for your companions, both visible and invisible await you to lead them to eternal and glorious deeds of which all forthcoming generations will speak. And while Orpheus was still gazing at the vision, he saw a tall white throne and four living creatures and many old men in front of it and among them stood the same lamb as if slain from the beginning of the creation of the world, which had seven horns and seven eyes. And it came forth and approached the throne and took a great book from the right hand of he who was sitting in the throne. And when he took the book, the four living creatures Many sages fell to their knees before the Lamb, while each and every one was holding a harp and a golden cup, and they began to sing in holy exultation with the words. May blessing and honor, glory, and sovereignty be unto he who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And then the vision began to fade, and Orpheus found himself once again standing before the altar in the temple of God Dionysus. Chapter 14. Amazed by what he had seen, young Orpheus requested an audience with the oracle in Pere and told him all about the vision. Once you find your guide, tell him to come to me and I shall give him directions for your journey. The oracle briefly replied and bid him farewell. Orpheus immediately began asking around for someone with knowledge and experience who could guide him and his companions on a long trip and promised a large sum of money to such a person. 
Especially if he was named a zone. Not many days passed and an Achean sailor named Yazon was brought to him who said that he was ready for such a task if the pay was indeed handsome. Orpheus was greatly pleased with this because the Achaean sailors, wait a second. Did I not read this story already? Hmm. Uh, well, I'll just continue because this is where I believe I stopped last time. Let me check the chat room real quick. Tell me if uh, you have heard this this story and if I had read it previously. Well, uh, somebody in the chat room said that these books sound Catholic. Um, and that very well could be, but they were in existence before the Catholic Church was ever even, you know, manifest. These writings are, as I said, the oldest script in the world. They predate even the Sumerian teachings by um, 2,000 years. And so if anything, the you know, the Catholic may sound like the Thracian because the Thracian came first. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to just continue because, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know I stopped um, in the last show, which was on the 25th, right there at 13 and so i'll continue but i'm familiar with this story i've read it numerous times so maybe that's why <clears throat> and i have shared it previously um because i did have chapters 13 through 18 i believe which was about this story and i had read it several years ago before receiving the first 13 chapters and so now i'm putting them all in order so i will continue orpheus was greatly pleased with this because the Achaean sailors were famous for being very educated skilled and insightful people when it came to the known world and they quickly struck a bargain about the price. The following day, Orpheus sent him to the oracle in Pere, as he and the oracle had agreed to do, so that he may receive directions for reaching their desired goal. Yezon returned to him, having written down everything the oracle had said. Now, this is an educated man, Orpheus said to himself. It seems that he is a literate Hellene. He can write, has understood, and written down everything accurately and clearly. Yezon's notes read, The oracle said the following, The destination can be reached only by sailing with an Argo. Note to the reader, Yezon is writing corrections on his own paper to what he believes he has heard, as with all the other corrections following. Correction, Argo, 
fast ship. Along the way, you must be aware of Hurepi, King Kos, and the Amazon women. Correction, Amazon women. And to reach Colheta, correction, Colheta, Colchis. You must learn from Finn, who knows the course of Foso, the river faces best. It is he who gazes upon the gods, who has sealed the images to lead you. And once you reach Iat, Ayat, king of Kolida, Colchis, you will have to defeat the bull, the man, and the golden dragon, and seek the help of the mighty Matia. Correction. Madia the sorceress. If you find yourself in need, seek advice from Hiron, correction, Chiron, the centaur. This is how you will find the golden fleece of tracks. There, I have finished speaking. Yezon said to Orpheus, I'm sorry about the corrections on my instructions, but the old man was mumbling, and I think that a lot of things are not clear to him. Also, regarding your vision, man, I know that he is no longer named Trax, but Freaks, because he came, he became Phrygian, and that he has left Troy with many ships carrying big cargo and settle down in Colchis. I have been to Colchis and I know many things about the way to it. We will need a very firm and fast ship, which I will seek to acquire myself. But I need your word that we will split the gold we find from the treasure equally so that I may pay for a good crew from my share. And after they reached an agreement, Yezon swiftly spread the word among the local wealthy merchants that he was setting sail towards Colchis to deliver an entire ship with golden hides from it, and was looking for offers with which he quickly amassed everything in need for their entire trip. Soon after, he managed to acquire a decent ship, and when he wrote the name Argo on it, he proudly summoned Orpheus, his companions, and the crew which he had hired to present. it to them. They feasted and hold the whole night through by Thracian custom and set sail east of Abdera in the morning. They sailed across the Thracian Sea, continued through the Hellespont, sailed across the Propontic Sea, continued through the Bospor, reached Salmedesos and then headed north all the way to Mazia, after which they again headed to the southeast along the coast of Bithynia and then firmly to the east across Pontus. They wandered for a long time following the sea currents and winds and although Yezon claimed to know the way to Colchis they just could not reach their destination they asked everywhere about Thrax or Fricus 
and about the Golden Fleece, but it seemed that none knew of either. All stared at them in wonder, and those ass seemed work-worn and burdened by their everyday problems and troubles. People everywhere are fighting for their daily ration of bread and to survive until the next day. And we're not only incapable of helping them reach their destination, but sought comfort and help from Orpheus and Yizong. They also came across war and rumors of war in some places, which forced them to work their way around some towns in order to avoid being caught between the warring tribes. They had traveled to nearly every coastal city in Thrace and Hellas, but still could not figure out where the Golden Fleece was. By good fortune, they had much food and water and also silver coins so that they were able to buy more provisions and continue their journey, which had now lasted several months. And although they aimed to sail near the coastline, they sometimes found themselves in rough waters and open sea, and fierce storms nearly sank their ship several times, but did not, thanks to the good crew, which Yezon had hired. And when they had finally lost all hope of reaching the coveted cultures on a bright sunny day amidst calm and quiet waters, Orpheus and his companions entered the estuary of a big river which flowed into the distant east, the Pontic Sea. And when they landed in a suitable dock, they learned that they had reached Colchis because this was the estuary of the river. Faces all were overcome by indescribable joy because it seemed that they had finally reached their destination. All right, we'll be right back for a second hour. Censorship and regulation is becoming an ever-growing problem in today's modern media. From the mainstream to YouTube and Google, the information you're looking for is buried by official narratives and propaganda. This is why TFR is 100% uncensored, unregulated, and listener-supported. The shows on TFR are not micromanaged by the station, and our hosts are free to speak their minds however they please. As such, the views and opinions expressed on our station are of those who make them. If you happen to hear anything offensive on TFR, please send us an email to toughtitty at tfrlive.com and we'll be happy to tell you that we really don't give a damn. We stand for freedom of speech and non-censorship. If you also stand for free speech, you can go to tfrlive.com slash sign up and sign up for a TFR supporter pass and help us in our mission to keep the airwaves uncensored and unregulated. TFR Live your uncensored and unregulated protection from deception. This is a major cheat. This is a fraud. This is an embarrassment. Here, the, the, the people rule. 
we were winning everything, and all of a sudden it was just called off. We, we, we have so many, we had such a big night. And then you take a look at the kind of margins that we've won them by. You just take a look at all of these states that we've won tonight. We, the people, will not be silent. We, the people, will not be bullied. We, the people, will not surrender. We'll come together. We have to stop treating our opponents as enemies. They can't catch us. They can't catch us. And now, now, every vote must be counted. They can't catch us. They can't catch us. When the count is finished, we will be the winners. This is a fraud. This is an embarrassment. This is a major cheat. This is a major cheat. This is a fraud. This is an embarrassment. Here, the, the, the people rule. Every vote must be counted. I'm not here to declare that we've won. We were getting ready to win this election. Every vote must be counted. We will be the winners. We were getting ready for a big celebration. It will be time for us to do what we've always done, done. Put the campaign behind us. Lower the temperature. These aren't even close. It's not like, oh, 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 what happened? And then they said, oh, oh, oh. They can't catch us. They can't catch us. And now, now, every vote must be counted. They can't catch us. They can't catch us. When the count is finished, we will be the winners. This is a fraud. This is an embarrassment. No one's going to take our democracy away from us. This is a fraud. This is an embarrassment. Not. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked one, obviously, under heavy, heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back everybody for second hour. You know, um, just thinking about the last episode, I think I had a moment of deja vu um, in that, yeah, it was just a moment of recognition and I thought that I was repeating something that you know, you know the way deja vu works, where you think you've already experienced. Um, and so, anyways, uh, I'm going to continue because I think I'll be able to finish this story and get to the end, which is exactly what I remember about the the whole deja vu with this particular story. All right, continuing. Once they set foot on the land, they were immediately surrounded by soldiers who asked them of their business there. And when the soldiers heard that they were sent to the king of Colchis, Ait, they laughed because there was no such king in Colchis, and they had never heard of one, not in the time of their fathers, nor in the time of their grandfathers. But once they learned that Orpheus was the son of a priest and that Yezon was the son of a king, they showed proper honor, respect, and hospitality. And their commander promised to send word of their arrival to Cleisthenes. Cliston, the king of Colchis. And after they spent several days in the inns and taverns and at the docks being taken around everywhere, 
by the soldiers who had accompanied them. They were finally invited to the royal palace, where they were taken to King Cleisthenes by his special guardsmen. The king invited and treated them to a feast, and as a token of his hospitality, and proceeded to listen very carefully and patiently to the long tales of their journey and about their goal in the presence of his nobles. My honored and highly reputed guests, he finally said, your determination and bravery for undertaking such a long and perilous trip truly amazes me and be sure that you have earned my respect and favor. I wish that my people and I could be of help in every way in order to assist you in finding what you seek. But alas, neither my councilmen, who are all wise, nor I have heard of this golden fleece, nor even of a famous traveler named Trax, or even Frix, who supposedly brought such a thing here, nor of him living in our lands, for that matter. I do not want you to think that my people are, or I are somehow trying to hide something from you, which is here amongst us. Or that we want to rob your people of Thrace and Hellas, for which we have always heard glorious words, and which we highly respect and desire to be good neighbors of and to live in peace. And because you have traveled so far to reach us, and because we have many other wonders, even if they are not this golden fleece. Please allow my nobles to take you to these places in my kingdom and be my guest for at least a month so that you may travel everywhere and taste of everything which is glorious among my people. And also to personally make sure that we are not hiding the golden fleece from you here. And once you are well rested and have delighted us with your honorable presence, please allow me to fill your ship with all necessary supplies of food, water, and clothing and to send you off with the utmost of good wishes to reach your destination and to have the protection of the gods so that you may return home safe and sound. Chapter 15. Orpheus, Yezon, and their companions happily accepted not only because they were extremely exhausted and truly needed a long rest, but because they thought that the Golden Fleece might still be in Cleisthenes' kingdom, even though he himself might not know about it. Endless nights of feasting with never-ending food and drink at royal tables began, and young, gorgeous girls not only shared and waited on the company of guests, but also sheltered the most vigorous of them in their arms during the wondrous warm summer nights in which talk of feats and love went hand in hand. The most enterprising of Argo's crew managed to display their exquisite goods from Hellas and Thrace on the city market and soon not only were they able to exchange them for an equal and adequate number of exquisite and unique goods from the craftsmen of Colchis, but they began receiving offers and orders 
involving no small number of gold and silver coin from the city merchants to bring even more of the same goods to Cultus. Soon a big part of Argo's crew and Orpheus's companions were so enamored with what had happened to them that they had forgotten why they had actually come to Colchis and what was the initial goal of their trip. At the end of their 30 day stay, Orpheus and Yazon were absolutely stunned to hear that more than half of their men did not intend to go back to their homelands. just yet but wanted to spend more time in cultures some of them the more well-read and literate ones said that they liked the splendor of the royal hospitality and had decided to accept Kleistenstein's offer to stay in service to him in his royal retinue Others had so strongly fallen in love with some of the women who sheltered them in their homes that they had decided to take them as their wives and invited Orpheus to stay for their weddings and bless their new homes. In Colchis, where they would now stay and live forever. A third party had already established a successful business and opened their own street stands in the city market, becoming partners with the merchants of Colchis and promised Yezon and Orpheus that they would soon come to Helas and Thrace for new goods with ships from Colchis, but that they could not return on the Argo because they would lose the greatest gains of their lives. If we have managed to amass so much silver and gold coin in less than a month, imagine what we could do if we worked harder. Your payment, Yezon, does not match even the smallest of what we have already obtained here in Colchis. But the greatest surprise, which was delivered to Orpheus, was by Yezon himself, who called Orpheus to speak privately right before their setting sail. To tell him, Orpheus, you will not believe this, but I have found Medea, of whom the oracle in Pere spoke of. She is kin of the Medi. That is why the oracle called her by Medea, although her real name is Aisha. She is a slave here in Chrysanthemum's domain, but she is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I fell in love with her and love her with all my heart. And she loves me very much as well. I told her everything about the Golden Fleece and it turns out she knows about it too. She shared with me that she is the daughter of the king of Medea and assured me that if I liberate her from her slavery and return her to her father's palace, he will thank me by giving me the golden fleece. We have journeyed so far, don't you think that it would be worth it to kidnap her from Kleistostyne's 
palace and go to her father in Medea. Orpheus gave serious thought to what he had heard. What if the slave woman was willing to promise anything just to escape from her bonds? Was she really a daughter of a king? And has she really seen the golden fleece? This had to be carefully investigated straight from the source. Yazan introduced her to Orpheus, who wished to speak with her privately. He questioned her about everything regarding the Golden Fleece. Aisha spoke in awe of Medea about the marvelous wonders and treasures the land possessed and looked at Orpheus without even attempting to hide her admiration for him with her dark caressing wet eyes and carefully peered into his face as if she was hoping to see the impact her words her words had on him from his expression. Whilst not missing the opportunity to throw back her beautiful locks to reveal her cleavage underneath her nearly transparent clothing. He, her uncovered thighs were inviting him to stroke them, and she did not even attempt to hide them with her long dress. Orpheus took stock of himself, reestablished his composure, and said, Tell me more about the Golden Fleece. Tell me of the runes you saw on it, and do you know their meaning? The girl seemed disturbed for a moment and began to blink with the long eyelashes on her eyelids. Runes? What do you mean? Oh, yes, the meaning of the fleece, she said, and turned her eyes to the side quickly, regaining her composure. Yes, yes, the meaning of the fleece is very important. It is filled with gold and jewelry, pearls, and many different precious stones. What else did you ask? Yes, there is so much gold that all of it weighs as much as an entire wagon filled with gold. With all that gold, whosoever possesses it, will be able to buy anything they please and will have the freedom and luxury to live happily for the rest of their lives. If you take me there, I will forever be your faithful beloved and you will be rich and happy with me and the fleece for the remainder of your days. When she said this, she threw herself onto Orpheus's lap and began to passionately hug and kiss him, allowing her almost transparent garment to slip off entirely, revealing all of her beauty. And she was half naked in front of him. Okay, okay, Orpheus said, and carefully removed her from himself. Go now. I must think thoroughly to devise a plan for such an escape from Chrysothides. Castle, if we are to go on such a long and dangerous journey, I shall discuss everything with you. Told me with Yezon. And then I shall make my final decision. 
But he has already decided and has given me his promise. He is just waiting for you to offer your support, Aisha said, covering herself with her garment on her way out of Orpheus's chamber. Later, with Yezon, Yezon, I do not think your beloved is really a princess. Orpheus said to Yezon when they were when they met after seeing her. A real princess would at least know how to read and write and would value those much more than what she could buy with a wagon filled with gold. I know that you love her and that is why you trust her completely, but I cannot risk the freedom and life of my companions. For some woman's intrigues, who can repay one's services only by fulfilling their lusty desires? I would advise against following her plans. Do not forget why we went on this long and difficult journey in the first place. The Oracle never said that the fleece is in Medea. And besides, to go there, we would have to go by foot through paths and lands of which we know nothing. Both of us would wind up as slaves in the lands of a merciless master at best. Is it not best, as you yourself have written down, to ask Chiron the centaur? Did you not say that you have indeed heard of him? But Orpheus, how do you expect me to know where Chiron the centaur is? Do you not know that he is but a myth and may not have even existed at all? How do you expect me to take you to him? I brought you to Medea herself. What more do you want? Yezon was very disappointed from Orpheus. His lack of support and stated that he will continue tracking down the Golden Fleece alone with Aisha because he was sure he was following the Oracle's instructions by doing so, and that she, out of all the prophecies so far, was the only prophecy which came true and is pointing in the right direction towards the fleece. They embraced in farewell in the same night after saying goodbye to Chrysothines and his nobles, Orpheus returned to the Argo with a few remaining crew, loyal to his mission. Orpheus didn't even get sleep through that entire night. Now where to, he thought. He unfolded Yezon's note with the oracles instructions once again he read and reread them again and again why couldn't he find king Ait? was he not supposed to rule colchis not some chrysothines was not the flea supposed to be here in Colchis? What could he do now? Return to Thrace, stripped of glory, and admit his total failure? Could it be possible that the oracle's words mean something different? For example, Aid, a correction made by Izan, because the oracle had been mumbling. But the oracle had said eat. 
and in the Thracian dialect of old. which the priest spoke in Pere, it meant the end, the endmost and the last. What if the king of Colchis was actually the endmost, the last king he had to reach to find out where the fleece was? Well, yes, but here he is. And he still does not know where the fleece is. What does it say next? The note read, and once you reach Ait, the king of Colchis, you will have to defeat the bull, the man, and the golden dragon. And seek the help of the mighty Medea, correction, Medea, the sorceress. If you find yourself in need, seek advice from Hyderon. Good action is on the center. This is how you will find. The Golden Feast of Trex. There I have spoken. It did not even say a thing about some Medea, because that was a correction made by Yezon. But about Matia, nor did it say a thing about Chiron, the centaur. But that the name Hyron was actually pointed out. Why did Orpheus see this just now? Why did he overtrust so blindly the Helen and his overpraised knowledge and supposed extensive experience? Because of him, he had lost more than half of his own companions, almost the entire ship's crew, and a whole year in wandering journeys in unknown lands, which had brought him nowhere. Perhaps if he was to find this Hyron, of whom the oracle spoke of, and seek out advice from him, then maybe none of this would have been entirely for nothing. Chapter 16. Uh, well, we're almost to break. but In the morning, Orpheus got off the ship and went. to the marketplace with several of his companions. All right, we'll be right back for final thing. Reasons can change your life. You don't get the answers to do well till you get the reasons. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the answers and only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reasons. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends that keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey. Not it's amazing money. how people have been raving about Aya Life all over Facebook. They've been posting their testimonials just because they want to get the word out because it's worked so well for them. If you're not familiar with Aya Life, it's a 99% pure CBD oil 
But the secret is the synergy between the hemp and the ayahuasca vine, the non-psychoactive component of the ayahuasca tea. We recently received an email from a wife whose husband has Parkinson's. For the first time, he's been able to sleep through the entire night. Another customer reported that they're no longer using NSAIDs because their tennis elbow has been relieved with IALIFE. The reports have been phenomenal and much more than we ever expected. Everyone should have access to this. That's why if you head on over to IALIFE.com right now and use coupon code TFR, we'll give you $5 towards your order. And we'll even ship it worldwide. That's IALIFE.com, A-Y-A, life.com. We exist in the security and comfort of our worlds. Paved paths, lights, and manicured lawns give us peace of mind that our world has been tamed, and we are its master. But other worlds exist on the edge of our sight. On the edge of our awareness, the shadows move. The woods fill with the unblinking eyes of the nightmares our ancestors warned us about. Some of us have stumbled into these forgotten realms, whether on purpose, or completely by surprise. I'm Brent Thomas. Join us on the Paranormal Portal Friday and Saturday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight Pacific Standard Time as we journey into the world of the paranormal phenomena. Enter the Paranormal Portal if you dare. <laughs> is Truth Frequency Radio. No hate, no hype, no fear. Real people, real radio. Welcome back, everybody. I see in the chat that there's some questions about the Vestures of Light and whether the Golden Fleece uh, was part of that story. But um, it is not. And as uh, Hebrew Hawaiian had brought forth, uh, the original vestures of light the garments of power were made from the skin that was sloughed on from the serpent in paradise um and so that is supposedly also why it has its shimmer um and this was all before this story of the lamb um and also of if you know about the um the fleece that this was said to be you know according to the story of Traxe, that like the story of Abraham and Isaac, that when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, that a ram had been, which was made in the early part of the creation of the world, that it was provided by the Most High as replacement for the slaughter of the son, which we know that that story was actually 
a premonition of the actions that the Most High would do in allowing Yeshua to be the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb that, you know, John said, behold, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So he was the Passover Lamb and was resurrected as the high priest uh, and that he was also the resurrected first fruits of the dead and that he brought Adam and his descendants as offering before the father. But anyway, so Adam had received the vesture of light and the rod of wonder before he was kicked out of paradise. These items were given to him as part of his initiation into the Melchizedek priesthood and that he would pass them on to his generations and to those that were of his bloodline, that they also would be initiated into the church of the firstborn and the order of the ancients, which you can go and check out that book, the order of the ancients to get more understanding on what I'm talking about. And with regard to the, the garments of power and the rod of wonder, um, Definitely check out the Vestures of Light and the Rod of Wonder. It's an incredible story. It was my most favorite book to write because it was just such a fascinating tale. And tracking down the history of that item and its use in the initiation of the Melchizedek priesthood uh, was truly fascinating. And then also the separation of these items uh, as Ham had stolen the garments of power from the Ark of Noah, and that they were hidden among the children of Cush until they were given to Nimrod. And then Nimrod used these garments to become the first world ruler, um, you know, the, doing the whole Tower of Babel deal. Um, and that he united all the peoples of the world at that time in a new world order, which the Most High did not like and separated them by tribe and tongue. And then, of course, we know that Esau had killed Nimrod, that he was hunting him specifically for these garments. And then once he um, secured them, that the, that night, the, the guards, the king's guard of Nimrod, they were hunting him down. And he thought he would be murdered anyways. And so he sold his birthright to his brother. And... Jacob received the deed for the cave of Machpelah and also um, received the birthright, the blessing of the birthright. And in the process of that exchange, that Esau received the supernatural sword of Methuselah, which was a giant killer. And it was this sword that he used to secure his power and to dominate over other peoples. So anyways, um, it's a, it's a definitely incredible story. So check that out if you don't know what I'm talking about. All right, we are going to continue with the story of the book of Navi. Chapter 16. In the morning, Orpheus got off the ship and went to the marketplace with several of his companions. They spent the entire day there asking 
salesmen, merchants, and passerbys, if they, any of them had heard of the man named Hiron. It was at sunset when suddenly they came across a group of sailors led by a man called Simhe, Simhe, from a land called Hemi, where are the greatest wonders of the world, the pyramids. Hiron, you say? Asked Simi, with a smile on his face. Why, Hiron means the priest of the god, son in On. Of course we know this, for we are from there. And settling sail back to On, which is Heliopolis, the day after tomorrow i can even take you to see him in person if you wish because i have to personally deliver some goods he ordered after two days the argo set sail from culture swallowing the egyptian samehe's fleet and four weeks later orpheus and his companions were standing before the face of the priest of on in heliopolis who was named Sa Oze, son of Orphe, we have been waiting for you to come for a long time because it was prophesied that your path comes through on. You are looking for the secret book of Tai Geti, the book of the God Word, and you have traveled the entire world to find it. But it was not where you sought it. However, we know of its whereabouts. For it is located where your great father Orphe was born, where the first Adam was and where the tree of the knowledge of Tot and Re is. It is guarded by the ancient serpent who attacks all who reach towards it so that they may not find salvation. For there upon it lies the eternal golden fleece of the God word. He who sacrificed himself from the world's creation so that all who seek and find it may gain not only primordial divine knowledge and great wisdom, but eternal life within him. He is the Lamb of God, he who bears the sins of the world and comes forth to the world nailed to a piece of wood, for his fleece is laid upon the eternal tree so that all may eat from its fruit, namely the fruit from the tree of life, and when eating from it receive healing from within its leaves, which are healing for the peoples of the world. You are most welcome to learn with us as our fathers once learned with your holy father, Orphe, O son of the great temple of God, Orphe. For every journey towards the truth initially begins in spirit and primarily there one must defeat the bull, the man and the serpent so that the gate stores the tree of knowledge and life may open. If you do not manage to defeat the Harepi and the Amazons during your flight in the divine spirit, you shall not overpower them in sailing as well, regardless of how many years you wander across the world. But for you to defeat them, for you to be victorious and overcome everything and remain honorable and steadfast, you need at least a little bit of matau. Namely, you must come to know the maiden of power unto whom the divine spirit rests upon, whose sacred name is 
Maria. Here among us, you will learn of the words of power and understand what Mata'o, the powerful speech, really means. The, that you will not be stricken, stricken like your friend when he followed the slave girl, Medea. Stay with us in the temple of On until your training is complete, as has been prophesied about you. In order for us to do all which is right by the covenant of the great Orphe, for we are all servants to the covenant. And after uttering these words of greeting, the priest of On welcomed Orpheus into the temple of On, where he lived and studied the secrets of Egypt for three whole years until the time came for him to receive his priestly scepter and journey back to his homeland of Thrace, where according to the priest of On, the scrolls of Orphe, which were covered with the golden runes of the Lamb of God. He who comes into the world were located. When Orpheus returned to the holy city of Pere, he immediately went to see the oracle of Dionysus, who gave him the directions for his journey and told him all about the experiences in all the lands he ventured in. He also told him of his training in the Temple of On and about the book of the names of the speech of Mata'u, in which all priests and ancient forces speak. The oracle asked him in return, with his kind-hearted sweetness, and what have you learned after all of this? My son, Orpheus gave the following answer. I learned that you were right when you warned us to watch out for the Harepi, because in the ancient speech of creation, this means to watch out for eating and wine drinking. And sadly, many of my companions and crew failed to do so and abandon me in cultures. I also learned that you were right when you warned us about the Amazon women too, which is in the same ancient tongue, means possessive women, fornicatresses, because women exactly of that sort possessed others of my comrade and made them abandon our mission. As did King Kos, namely the power of money, blinded many of my remaining comrades, and they too abandoned me for the sake of money, making which foreign lands had to offer. Furthermore, I learned that the king, which I had reached in Colchis, was not Ait, but Eat, meaning the final king or king of the final farthest land which I had to reach and this saved me from being misled by my guide Yezon and a slave girl into going further to the distant Medea. But I would never have found all this out if it were not for my happy run in with the merchant Simi. For only he alone knew who Hiron the person of whom you said I was to seek advice from if I ever found myself in need was. If it were not for Simi, I would not have met Hiron, the priest of On in Heliopolis. And even then, I would not have been able to understand the meaning of a single one of the words you had spoken to me. It was only after my training with him that I was able to see that of the entire group, only I was able to overcome the will of the flesh embodied in the bull, which had thwarted many of my companions, and to overcome 
the weak, false, human interpretations and arbitrary understandings which stirred a man like Yezon. and prevented him still from understanding your prophetic directions. Despite of his vast knowledge and intellectual abilities, and that I have been safeguarded from lust for gold, for pleasure and success, which hide within the lures of the wicked snake, which is the enemy of all the followers of the true path of God. As you can see, I've learned a great deal of things, but there is one thing I have not been able to understand and failed to do so even to this very moment. And so let me ask the wisest of the wise. Why tell me, why did you have to speak to my God, Yezon, in so many foreign to him riddles so that I had to sail across a multitude of seas and wander around a multitude of lands and lose many days, months, and even years of my life trying to reach the realization of such simple things which you could have told me straight away with ordinary clear speech. Oh, my dear boy, were my words actually meant for Yezon? Was it not God who showed himself in the image of the Lamb of God in your vision, and personally told you that your guide must be Yezon, and that he will return the throne of your forefathers to you. You actually thought an Achaean named Yezon possessed the power to return the throne of your forefathers to you? Why did you follow a Hellene to lead you in the path towards the holy secrets of God? When have the Achaeans and the Danians understood something sacred in order for them to be your guide towards it? Can a Hellene really be mediator between you and the sacred things and the secrets of the divine ancient speech of Thrace? Were you rather not supposed to teach and enlighten him instead of him you? Never follow the Hellenes in anything because of all their paths are led by the lust for women's flesh and gold and for power and the perfid perfidiousness of the snake has entangled them. In all of this, like in an unnavigable labyrinth. But you were supposed to follow a Zon, namely your bright inner self, who was in the hand of your God, the God of Orphe and the God of your fathers, the God of Thrace. The uttered words of prophecy were your, for your bright self, and if you had followed the meaning in your ancient father tongue, you would have done a lot better from the very start. For every sacred path and every sacred mission initially began in spirit and not on some sailor ship regardless of how well-educated and erudite he may be. For the wisdom and philosophy of man is sluggishness to act, and philosophy, fool philosophy to God. There it took you this much time to understand those which you now call simple things. But is finding oneself a simple thing? And does time spent looking for God's wisdom amount to time lost? And how can you call your wandering in foreign lands pointless, as if the experience gained from them means nothing? And if I did speak with simple words, as if I were talking to a simple man, what worth would that have been to you? And would the prophecy of Orpheus studying in the land of Hemi with the priests of On Heliopolis, where the great word of Orphe was taught by the priest kings, come to pass? And without this, how were you to find the golden fleece of the divine word? And how were you to read its runes, which to this very day are upon the walls of the pyramids of Egypt? 
Unsearchable are God's ways, my child, and wisdom reveals its riches only to the wise. And God himself tests the wisdom of all by observing them in their countless everyday thoughts and paths, even wanderings from the cradle all the way to the grave. And since you stand here led to me once more, you have come to continue down the glorious path and mission for which the Almighty has personally pre-known, approved, and preordained you. Welcome, young one, once again to the land of the divine covenant and the secrets of creation. Now you may resume your training in the temple of Pele so that you may reach the next stage of your initiation in the divine mysteries, those of Urim and Thummim, so that whatsoever you bind in heaven shall be bound on earth, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Only thus are you to find the golden fleece of Thrace and return it to be forever kept in Pere. Um We've reached chapter 17, and I am going to stop there. I've still got quite a bit to go, but this is a, a good stopping point, I believe, for this evening. And I just want to thank everybody in the chat room once more. We've got quite a, a large and uh, active group, and I do appreciate and love all of you. So good to see you, uh, Tammy, George, Clark, Ebanks, Hebrew, Hawaiian, Laura, Wallace, Brick, uh, Adrian from Oz, and so many of the other people, Jamali, um, all those that are in the previous stream of chat, we appreciate all of you. Thank you for your support. I'm glad that you are enjoying the story. Uh, certainly, the Thracian twists on the these ancient stories, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, the, the Golden Fleece, and um, the study of the divine mysteries, the Lamb of God, and how it all ties together. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely a perspective that we've never heard of previously. Um but certainly, you know, those obstacles have prevented many of us from walking the narrow way and uh, in keeping our footsteps on the path of the kingdom and doing the work of the kingdom as well. Um, so many fall away to the temptations of lust and gold. All right. Good night, all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you, and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you in your seeking.